This morning, I want to invite all of us, first of all, to take out your Bibles. We're going to turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. And we're going to be reading quite a few chunks of Scripture today. Not all of the Scriptures will be flashed onto the screen, so I really want to encourage us to read from your Bible, whether it's your phone or your iPad, or in the very rare occasion, a physical Bible. (laughs) How many of us actually have a physical Bible today? Pastor Lip, you know, you need to come and... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> lay hands on the rest of us, but no, 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 I'm just kidding, okay? It's, it's the same, right? It's the same. So, yeah, just turn um, to your Bibles, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. And I want to share uh, a message that really was quite unexpected when the Lord spoke to me about this. It just, you know, sometimes God speaks to you through Scripture and you just kind of go, <gasps> I didn't know that, or, oh my goodness, you know, it was so simple, it's always been there, but uh, you didn't quite see it that way. And this, this is one of those messages that, that really just gripped my heart, and I'm, I'm very excited to share it. And this is from the book of Ezekiel, and I've titled it, When God Doesn't Seem Fair. And, um, you know, have you ever heard people remark or say, or maybe yourself, you've even had this, had this thought that you know, God doesn't seem very fair. You know, some of his, uh, some of the things that we see around us, the things that we see happen to people, like there's, there's kind of some weird sense of justice that's going on here and you just feel like, but that doesn't seem or feel fair. You know, this is actually not an uncommon nor a new sentiment amongst people. And right through the Bible, there are actually many records of people who actually feel this way. They, they question and they sometimes even doubt the justice and the fairness of God. And the prophet Ezekiel in this chapter, chapter 18, documents one such season in Israel. And this was happening in the people of God. So these were not the Gentiles. These were not the people who did not believe in God. These were the people who believed in God. And at that time, there was a popular proverb in Israel, and it goes like this. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Have you ever heard this proverb before? I mean, if you've read Ezekiel 18, you would have heard it before. I mean, it's not a proverb that we use these days, but it was a very popular proverb used in the time um, when Ezekiel was writing about this, this episode. And it actually describes the idea that, you know, if the fathers were the ones who ate the sour grapes, you know, have you eaten sour grapes, like really sour? When you eat something really sour, what do you do? You go like, right? The... The teeth are set on itch, right? So the, the idea of it is, if the fathers have eaten the sour grapes, which actually meant like sin and, and done the things they're not supposed to do, but it's not the fathers who taste the sourness, but it is the children who taste the sourness. And so the proverb essentially means that the children are paying for the sins of their parents, their ancestors, okay? So there is a sense of injustice. The younger people feel like it is not fair. How come I am paying the price for the sins of my forefathers, my fathers, my, my ancestors? And there's always a sense of, of like God's not really fair. But um, so this was like kind of the murmuring and the, and the proverb that was quite common in those days. So whenever, for example, someone sees like a child or a young person who is going through a difficult time in their lives, and they're like, you know, this person doesn't seem to have sinned or we don't see that this young man has done anything wrong. Oh, this young man is paying for the sins of his father. Because, you know, he hasn't done anything wrong, but the father has, is, a, is a bad man, an evil man, done bad things. So you see... The son has to pay for the the sins of the father. And so people thought that way. And it was so widespread in the thinking of the, the people of God that God himself had to speak. And he, and he spoke to the prophet Ezekiel. And he spoke a very important and a, a very heavy word through the prophet Ezekiel to address this mindset that was widespread amongst the people. So whether it was the people of God then, or the people of God now, I believe that these principles that the Lord revealed through His spoken word through the prophet is still relevant today. So this is what we want to talk about or what we want to explore. So what do we need to know 
When we feel that God doesn't seem fair, and how should we respond? Okay, so the first thing I want to highlight to us is we need to align back to what is true. So verses 1 to 4 in Ezekiel chapter 18, I'm going to read this, so follow me because we're going to be reading almost the entire chapter of Ezekiel. If you cannot remember anything I say today, at least you can walk out of this auditorium Remembering that you have read the whole chapter of Ezekiel chapter 18, which is an accomplishment for many of us, okay? Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 to 4, it reads, The word of the Lord came to me and it said, What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel, for everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child, both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. So the Lord was very upfront to the prophet Ezekiel in addressing the murmuring of the people. He was not mincing his words. In verse 3, the Lord declares that the people you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. Like, you will not, full stop, period. There was nothing like muddy about it. And he states it in no uncertain terms, the one who sins is the one who dies. Very simple. So even though there may be situations where children may suffer as the consequences of the parents' wrongdoing or bad choices, the Lord was not talking about that kind of situations. He was talking about this mindset of a transference of guilt, a transference of consequence. He was addressing the wrong beliefs of the people. These wrong beliefs were leading to a spirit of fatalism and irresponsibility where people just kind of shrug off any sense of personal responsibility for their sin and then conveniently put the blame on their ancestors, okay? So this was the climate of which this proverb was being used. And so this portion of scripture, number one, is that it teaches us very clearly that what is popular may not be right. What may be a popular saying may not be right and may not be true. This was a very popular saying of that day. But God himself said, you people are believing the wrong things and he had to speak it clear to the people. How is that relevant to us today? You and I know we have many popular sayings. Popular beliefs even perpetuated through the church by Christians, by leaders, and people spout out things and teach things. And after a while, we, 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 we kind of not, we, we don't have the ability anymore to weigh, is what this person say true? Is, is, is what this person, uh, is, who, you know, this person is teaching this certain thing, is it true? We, as the people of God, we forget how to um, determine and how to look at what is true. And we get swayed by popular sayings. And I think this is a very good minor in Ezekiel chapter 18. What is popular may not be true. So I think whenever we feel like God is not fair or if we feel something about God that you kind of know that, you know, I, like, I don't think God's like that, but what I see kind of makes me doubt a little bit. I want to I encourage us, instead of carrying that doubt and allowing to build um, maybe certain wrong beliefs in your heart. I want to ask us to run back to the truth. Go back to the Word of God. Go back to sound teaching and sound doctrine and find out and believe what is true. And do not be like the people that Ezekiel was speaking to, that God was speaking to through Ezekiel, where they were embracing wrong beliefs simply through a popular saying. So will we be open to God's voice when He speaks? I think that's the other concern that as leaders, as parents, we all have. You know, it's not that we don't want to know God's truth, but sometimes when God speaks, when there's a revelation, when there is a, a very, almost like a very deep conviction of our hearts, when God reveals something to bring us back to repentance, are we able to even humble ourselves to say, God, we have been wrong. We have believed wrongly. We have taught wrongly. We have acted wrongly and we want to repent. So I think the issue is not just about also finding truth, but responding to truth. And so this was a very important reminder 
first of all, that uh, in this chapter of Ezekiel, that God laid out, first of all, you shall not use this proverb anymore in Israel. And so I think that's the first thing we have to come and when we think about whether God is not fair or God is something that we know it's out of His character, okay? The second thing that the Lord brings up through Ezekiel is this. He, he is not just uh, wanting to address the wrong thinking, but He wants to highlight the individual responsibility towards sin, the individual responsibility of our own actions, our own choices, and our own thinking. So the second point is about individual responsibility. The, the Lord outlines two scenarios okay, in, in the coming verses. The first scenario is a righteous man who has an unrighteous son. And then the, the second scenario is an unrighteous man who has a righteous son. All right, so you see the two different scenarios. And this is even happening even in our day. Sometimes we see um, a man who is very righteous, but his children, his, his sons and his daughters may be a little bit wayward. And we see the converse is true, the reverse is true as well, right? Someone who may be very rebellious and, and uh, sinful against the Lord may have offspring and children who are uh, really walking closely with the Lord. And so we, we don't know why this happens, but the Lord is addressing this and he's, He brings some clarity and truth. So I want to read just um, kind of excerpts of this passage, the, the next few verses, because it's very long. So I'm just going to kind of pull out the main verses, okay? So just follow me. From verse 5, it says, Suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and right. Verse 9, that man is righteous, he will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. In the verse 10, it says, suppose he has a violent son. Okay, suppose this righteous man has a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these things, though the father has done none of them. Will such a man live? Meaning, will this violent son live? He will not. Because he has done all these detestable things, he is to be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. So here we have a righteous father and an unrighteous son. And the question was, since the father was a righteous man, if the, fa if the son is unrighteous, will the son inherit the father's righteousness and get away with his sin? So the answer is no. Because the one who sins is the one who dies. The principle of individual responsibility. So, there's, so uh, the, the unrighteous son cannot say, I can do whatever I want. I, uh, my father is going to pray for me. La. My father is very holy. My father is uh, you know, very well known in the Christian world. He has done a lot of good works. So uh, never mind, la. my father is going to pray for me. I'm still going to go to heaven. No, so the Lord was addressing very clearly. It doesn't work that way. Whoever sins will be the one who pays the consequence. And then God continues in, chapter, uh, in verse 14, Ezekiel chapter 18. In verse 14, it, it is uh, written, But suppose this son, which is the violent son, has this manner, has a son who sees all the sins his father commits, and though he sees them, he does not do such things. So we're talking about an unrighteous father and a righteous son. He keeps my laws and follows my decrees. He will not die from his father's sin. He will surely live. But his father will die for his own sin because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother, and did what was wrong among his people. Yet you ask, why does the son not share the guilt of his father? Since the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. So similarly, in this situation, if the wicked man has a son who is righteous, the, the son will not pay for the guilt of, will not pay for the sins of the father. So again, it's the same scenario as, as I've said before. At, at the end of the day, the Lord is saying, whoever has sinned will pay, and whoever has been righteous will also reap the rewards of righteousness. Again, the principle of personal responsibility. But what was very interesting is that the people of God questioned God about this principle. They questioned God's sense of, they questioned God's fairness and justice. In fact, they essentially said that 
God, this is not fair. This is not fair. The Father is wicked and the Son is righteous. And you are God, now you're saying that the Father pays for his own sin and the Son who is righteous doesn't pay for his Father's sin. God, that is not fair. Essentially, that was what the people were saying. They were saying God's sense of justice was wrong and was warped. And hence, the popular saying and the proverbs that came out of this wrong belief. It's very, very interesting how, um, we, how people can really slowly but surely veer away from truth if we don't align ourselves and kind of soak ourselves in truth long enough. You know, just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and we inch our way towards wrong belief sometimes without even knowing it. And after a while, we have hurt mentality because when everyone thinks the same way, it must be true. And that is really scary. And then, you know, even the people who have always felt that, no, this is not true, this is not right, you will find that those voices become silent and they become oppressed. And the voices who preach or who promote or who push untruth begin to get louder and louder and louder. And that is how you see how society can collapse and how an entire community can share in wrong thinking without even thinking about it. So I, I think that this is a very relevant piece of um, scripture that we can even apply to our day. You know, I, without me having to name out topics or, or issues in our society, all of us know we have a couple of things that we always, we kind of hear it and we wrestle with it all the time. And especially for parents, we know that our children, our children are exposed to so much more and it is getting harder and harder to teach them the ways of God. But one very important foundational principle, we see the Lord teaching His people, everyone takes personal responsibility. You know, like if, if as a parent, you know, I have been really, really righteous. I walk closely with God and I do everything. But my child is wayward. It is my responsibility to, to teach my child. But I cannot live, I cannot take the guilt of my child. You get what I mean? Much as it's painful if my child walks away from God. And I know that's the consequence. There's a consequence to his or her actions. And I will want to bring my child back. But as a parent, I cannot take my child's guilt upon myself. As, as people, we cannot do that. We can pray, we can teach. But everyone is fundamentally responsible for your own actions and choices. You can't pass off, we can't pass on righteousness any more than we can pass on guilt. You know, these are all personal things that are imputed to the individual. So I want to share with you a, a little bit of a reflection and a story that I, I came across uh, in my own experience, in my work as well. Many of you know I work with um, women and families that face un, un, unsupported pregnancies. And not too long ago, I was faced with a situation where um, a young lady was pregnant and she was un, unmarried. And uh, the parents were very, very adamant that she had to abort the baby but the pregnant girl herself was hoping that she could not, uh, that she doesn't need to abort the baby, and was looking for other options other than abortion. And so we had this um, tension within the family where the the pregnant woman wanted to keep the baby, but her parents were very very adamant about her aborting. And in particular, the mother was very kind of very strong about her stand. And, and even though we, we tried to explain to her that, you know, um, the, the, what, what is going to happen to your daughter after she has the abortion and, you know, the kind of effects that she may have, the, the consequences she may have. And because they were also um, Christians, we also brought in the fact that, you know, you're going to have to understand that this is not something that God will approve of. And I, I, I still remember one of the conversations that really struck me, and that was at the height of the pain and the height of the tension in the family. The mother was so upset with the fact that he, her daughter didn't want to abort. She told the daughter that, you know, never mind, you just abort and I will tell God that it was, my, it was my choice, okay? You don't have to 
bear and bear the consequence. You don't have to pay for your sin. I will tell God, I am the one who asks you to abort. Let it be upon my, my hands. You know, let it be upon me. It's nothing to do with you. You know, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And she kept telling her daughter that. Hey, you know that pain? <laughs> you can hear it is the mother's love as well. But yet, on the other hand, there was just this sense of, but, you know, ma'am, you cannot bear that kind of responsibility. It's not up to you. And I had to tell this lady that at the end of the day, you are not the one having the abortion. Your daughter is the one and your daughter will have to bear the consequences of what she has done. You cannot take it for her. And so it was a very interesting situation that, that I observed. But thankfully, after a lot of um, back and forth and prayer and desperate conversations, thankfully there was a good outcome to the situation. The baby wasn't aborted and, they, and the family chose something that gave everyone life. So that was, that was the encouraging part. But what I wanted to point out was this whole idea that sometimes we have that even towards our children, we are like, you know, God, I... I, I I bargain with you, God, you know, my, my child may not be doing so well, but can I take my child's guilt and can you let my child off? And so in Ezekiel chapter 18, it's very clear it does not work that way. Everyone has to take personal responsibility for your own actions. And so that is the weight of what is important and what is uh, serious for all of us. The, I, want to, I just need to add two exceptions regarding this, okay? The imputing, uh, regarding the principle of the imputing of sin and righteousness, and it has got to do with Adam and Jesus. So in Scripture, in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it is written, For just as through the disobedience of the one man, who is Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous, okay? There is an exception. With Adam, the exception was that through Adam, we inherited the, the, the consequence of sin, you know, the sin nature. But through Jesus, we also now can be righteous through Jesus. So these are unique exceptions. So unless you are Adam or Jesus, then this applies to you, okay? Then it is through you that you can pass on either guilt or righteousness. But if you are not Adam nor Jesus, then it doesn't work that way. Each of us still have personal responsibility, okay? I think this is very important to understand. Let's, some of us quote this uh, um, uh, uh, verse in Romans 5. We will say that, you know, it's through Adam, that means I can pass on my sin to my children and, and vice versa, those two are unique exceptions um, that God has planned. And it is not against God's principles. Uh, later, I will explain to us. It is actually according to His plan of redemption. So let's continue um, uh, and it will get clearer. So those two men, Adam and Jesus, were absolutely unique in all of humanity and they were part of God's redemption plan. And that teaching is layered upon the principle of personal responsibility. It is not in conflict so the bottom line is still, we are ultimately responsible for our sins and our righteousness. So the Lord brings us deeper now as we go into verse 21. So the, the, the thing is, so now we cannot blame anyone for our sin, right? Because it's personal. It's our responsibility. I can't point the finger at anyone anymore. So then what? Then, oh, oh, I'm stuck. Because if I'm deep in my sin, then where, what hope do I have? And the, the Lord's answer is clear. It is the word repentance. So in verse 21, it says this, But if a wicked person, I love this, if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, the person will surely live, they will not die. Do you know how powerful that is? Do you know how powerful that is? It, it's, we, we may read this as words, but if we understand that the Lord has, it doesn't make it very, very complicated. He just says, okay, you may have really messed up, you may have really committed all sorts of stuff, okay? But when you turn and you walk in my ways, 
and my decrees, you will live. I say, God, not fair, right? It doesn't sound very right, you know? Like, the person should pay for his sins, right? The person should, you know, die, and no matter how, how can you wipe off the person's sins just like that? But the Lord says, as long as this person repents, the person will live. That's what He says. And in verse 22, it says, none of the offences they have committed will be remembered against them. Because of the righteous things they have done, they will live. Maybe, maybe this is what people felt was unfair. Maybe they also felt that if someone has been so wicked, and just because they repent, how can they get away with it? And, and so the idea of God's justice was just a, a bit mind-boggling for everybody. But God is clear. Based on the principle of personal responsibility, if you have committed sins and you have been wicked in your life, but you genuinely repent, turn from your wicked ways and walk in the ways of the Lord, you will not die. And the offences you have committed will not be held against you. Powerful stuff. Let's continue. The hope that we have is the hope that we can repent and that the Lord forgives. I mean, it's simple, but that is something that we have to com repeatedly stand upon. And to repent is to turn away from what is wrong and then to start doing what is right. It's not turning away and just doing nothing, but it is also walking in the ways of the Lord and obeying His decrees. When we repent, the Lord says, we will live and not die. Okay, let's look at verse 23. The Lord continues to say this, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares, declares the servant Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? My friends, hear this. The Lord says, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? The Lord does not take pleasure in the death of anyone, even the wicked. He does not take pleasure. He does not say, good, I want to send all these wicked, terrible people to eternal death. That's not our God. He does not take pleasure even in the death of the wicked. How? Why, God? Not fair. They are wicked people. They should die an eternal death and never ever appear again. You should swipe them off the face of eternity. You should like make them poof and, you know, you know that's how we, we kind of get angry, right? But the Lord says, I don't delight in the wicked dying. It's that this really gripped me when I realized that it wasn't just about God not wanting anyone to die, but that He does not take any pleasure. He, he uses those words. You will see the heart of God in this. It's a powerful verse that reveals His heart. And this is the crux of the gospel. He does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He does not want sinful, wicked, rebellious, stubborn, foolish people to die. He doesn't. He does not. His plan is not to send bad people to hell. And I, I, I feel like this is such a fundamental thing. I'm asking myself and asking God, God, why am I saying this to, to church? Because shouldn't we already know this? But I, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like the Holy Spirit just really wants us to, re to remember this today. Coming back to the heart of the gospel. God loves all people. He does not want anyone to die. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 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 
Again and again, that word comes out. You know, it's not just about once saved, always saved. Because in verse 24, it's written, Ezekiel 18, verse 24, it says, If a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness they are guilty of and because of the sins they have committed, they will die. So the Lord also addresses this whole mindset. Is it once safe, always safe? Once upon a time, I was righteous, then I turned away from God. You know, God was addressing the, the importance of walking with Him. He is saying that it is not about, you know, once upon a time, you, you walked with me and then you intentionally turn away from Him. So the, the turning is both ways. You can turn away from our, your wicked ways or you can also turn away from your righteous ways. And either way, there are consequences. So the turning for us is important. And some of us turn, <laughs> turn back and forth, back and forth, right? Ultimately, I believe that the Lord is merciful. And as we have read, He does not want anyone to perish. I believe that He will give all of us the most chance. So that we turn, 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 turn. But at the end of the day, we must turn towards righteousness, okay? So don't keep turning back and forth, but left and right, flipping and flopping. Whatever it is, we, whatever direction we turn, make sure that at the end of the day, we are facing God and we are facing the way of righteousness. But God gives us many, many chances. And it's not just about once safe, always safe. However, God is serious about this. If you were righteous before and you turn away from your ways, your righteousness will not be remembered. That's what he says here. I didn't say it. He said it. You read it, Ezekiel chapter 18. Then listen to what the people said. And I'm going to wrap up very soon with this. Verse 25, the people say, Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. Okay, so after the Lord says all this, he, he kind of wraps it up and says, The people are saying the way of the Lord is not just. Hear you Israelites, is my way unjust? Is it not your ways that are unjust? If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin, they will die for it. Because of the sin they have committed, they will die. But if a wicked person turns away from the wickedness they have committed and does what is just and right, they will save their life. Because they consider all the offenses they have committed and turn away from them, that person will surely live, they will not die. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? You know, when the Lord repeats himself, <laughs> we better pay attention. He says it twice. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? I don't know about you. I'm like, I can't imagine. If I was there listening to God, I think I would just kind of wither and collapse on the ground like I, I don't ever want to hear these words from God oh my goodness God so sorry you know I messed up no 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 God you are not unjust okay I'm the foolish one I'm thinking oh my goodness these are really strong words from God and I'm like God have mercy on us may we never have need you to reprimand this way but if you need to God have mercy on us and speak the truth as well wake us up God if we need to turn from our wicked ways. And, but the Lord was saying, the people are saying, I am not just. Even though I'm saying, whoever has sinned will bear the consequences, whoever is righteous will live, the people are saying there's not, that God is not just. So there is an inherent desire for people to blame someone else for our misery and suffering. There is an inherent desire for us to just push sin and responsibility away. But the Lord says, no, take the responsibility and repent. Repent. The Lord is firm in reprimanding His people. We all want His justice. Uh, we, we all want His mercy. But very few want and accept His justice. Repentance, repentance, repentance. Lastly, 
this side of the cross, we have news that the people of Ezekiel, of Ezekiel's time does not know. And this side of the cross, we know that now we have new life in Jesus Christ. We no longer have to sacrifice goats and sheep. And sheep. And we no longer have to wait once a year for the high priest to go into the, the temple and hope that he comes out alive. We no longer have to do that because our high priest has gone in and come out once and for all. Verse 30, Therefore, you Israelites, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the servant Lord. Repent! Exclamation mark. Turn away from all your offences, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offences you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? Remember, at the backdrop, the Lord says, I do not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says, why will you die? Why do you want to die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. I feel like this is really the word of the Lord for us today. And I don't know where each one of us are with, with your walk with God. Personally, even corporately as a family. But I just feel like the Lord is just saying again and again, repent and live. And we know now in John 3, 16 and 17, it's written, For God so loved the world. That, his gave, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Why should you die, says the Lord? Repent and live. So whether it is under the old or the new covenant, God is consistent. He doesn't want to lose anyone to the consequences of sin. In the Old Testament, there was the book of the law that was meant to direct the people to live righteously. But on this side of the cross, we have Jesus Christ who embodies the entire redemption plan of God. And then when God says, repent, he says, I don't need you to go through all the stuff of the law because now all that is fulfilled through my only son, Jesus Christ. And all you need to do is to repent, receive Jesus, and you will live. You know, Jesus Christ became sin so that he could pay the ultimate price for our sin. And this is the highest expression of justice and mercy. God did not go against His own word, but He took it upon Himself to become the solution and the way so that we all can be saved. So is God unfair? Is God unjust? Maybe we need to ask ourselves, who or what have we been listening to if we believe that? God who spared nothing so that the most wicked of us have a chance to live instead of die. God who says that we all now have the ability to choose to walk with Him. God who has set up everything so that we, His people, can choose life because He does not gain pleasure in the death of the wicked. My friends, today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, do not harden your heart. If there is anger and resentment, hatred and fear in your heart, today is the day to repent. If you are walking in sin, and it may be something that you struggle with for a long time, you may even th see and recognize that it may be generational. Today is the day where you can come before the Lord in repentance and live. And in the Word it says, He remembers your offenses no more. Aligning back to the truth, taking personal responsibility, repenting, and knowing that our hope is in Jesus Christ. And that is the heart of the gospel. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we are just so amazed. Thank you, God, that you do not delight nor take pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
And God, even though we feel sometimes that it's not fair, people should pay for their sins, yet God, they do. They do. You say those, the person who sins is the one who dies. But God, I thank you that it didn't end there. I thank you so much, God, that your heart is for none to perish. And today we come before you, Father, and we want to take personal responsibility for our choices, for our sin. We want to say, forgive us, God, for sinning against you in whatever way. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. And I ask, God, that you would help us to stay on the path that is narrow. God, that we would never turn away from your ways because we know that you have done everything. You have made the way for us to follow you and to have eternal life. And Jesus, thank you for being the great high priest for us. Thank you for allowing the Father to make you who had no sin to become sin for us so that we may become the righteousness of God. Thank you, Father. I want to invite any one of us this morning, if you know that you have not been walking with God, and if you have never acknowledged Jesus to be your Savior, Jesus who had died on the cross for our sins and rose again three days later so that He is now seated at the right hand of the Father and that all of us can have eternal life in and through Him. If you have never done that, I want to invite you. I want to invite you to make that decision because it is your personal choice that you have to receive Jesus as your Saviour, as your Lord, as your King, as your God. If you would like to do that, I just want to invite you to pray together with me this simple prayer. I know we are all masked up in a way that's good. You can say it out softly under your breath. No one can hear your, can see your mouth moving. You have that moment between you and God. Pray after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Even though I don't know you very well, I know that you love me. I need you to forgive me for my sins. Today, I want to walk with you. I ask you to help me to live a new life. I turn away from my old ways. And today, Jesus, be my Lord and be my Savior and lead me to the path of life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, God, for coming into our midst today, God. And Holy Spirit, stir our hearts so that we may truly be people who will walk in your ways and who will not despise the word and the truth that you are speaking to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.